Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here with another new episode, a very interesting exploration in a lost comic strip, Mitzi McCoy. One of the comic strips of the 1940s uh, that was done by Craig Collins. You may not know Craig Collins, but was a cartoonist of note. Uh, Certainly managed to get himself syndicated in dozens of newspapers across the country. And uh, The Complete Mitzi McCoy is a brand new collection from Craig Collins' uh, grandson, Brian. And it's an exploration of the strip that also led to an adventure strip called Kevin the Bold. And uh, this is a great collection because it not only typifies the kind of comic strip entertainment that was going on in the 1940s. This was episodic adventure. Mitzi McCoy, uh, kind of a pinup girl adventurer, much in the mold of Brenda Starr and Torchy Smith, some more famous uh, versions of the female adventurer back in the day. But uh, also in a lot of ways... Cray explored uh, possible different tones for the strip, leaning on other characters, creating a, a very large cast of characters in, say, the uh, guys of something, or in, in the same form as Gasoline Alley, for example. And uh, it's really interesting because you ch- you you uh, discover the tones in each different story as Cray was trying to discover his voice, finally settling on Mitzi's ancestor a kind of Conan-esque or Prince Valiant, more like a Prince Valiant kind of adventure strip called Kevin the Bold. And we do get the first uh, couple's Kevin the Bold stories in this volume as well. So it's really interesting, and and I appreciate uh, what Brian Collins has done in terms of exploring his grandfather's strip. Um, Thought of it well enough that they they tried to sell it and get it, obviously, in as many papers as possible. But, uh, you know, this is kind of one of the uh, foot soldier cartoonists, if you will. And I, I don't say that to demean uh, what Craig Collins did with his comic strip work. You're going to hear a lot about his uh, illustration career, which, uh, again, was uh, well regarded, certainly in the state of Michigan. He was an important cartoonist to the state of Michigan. But, um, you know, wasn't a Milton Kniff, um, wasn't a Leonard Starr or a uh, Alex Raymond or some of the other greats of the 40s uh, through the 60s. But, um, again, I think a very significant comic strip and also kind of explores uh, what it was like to be a working uh, comic strip artist trying to break through. There's some great stuff in there. Correspondence with Collins' editors and uh, a lot of promotional stuff that was sent to prospective newspapers to entice them to pick up the Mitzi McCoy strip. And uh, it's great. It really is. The illustration is fantastic. The storytelling is clear. Um, and I think, again, it's an e- exploration of what it must have been like being a working cartoonist uh, trying to uh, find a syndicated audience. The Complete Mitzi McCoy, it's volume one of uh, Craig Collins' uh, journey uh, through his cartooning career that Brian Collins, his grandson, has put out. It's an excellent book. It's from Lost Art Publishing. And uh, again, as I've said uh, on other shows, this is another great uh, thing that would be an excellent Christmas present for uh, your comic historian in your life. So I'm uh, really looking forward to my conversation today with Brian Collins about his grandfather, Cray, on today's Word Balloon. This episode of Word Balloon brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thanks a lot, League, for your support. It's the beginning of December. Uh, the subscriptions came in for November, and I thank you for your support. You are the executive producers of Word Balloon uh, through your contributions at patreon.com. I say it all the time and I mean it. Word Balloon is free. It will always be free. But if you like what I do here and want to help out the cause and can afford it, please consider subscribing to Word Balloon via patreon.com. You can go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon. That's where my page is. Or you can go to wordballoon.com, click on the Patreon ad, and that will take you to my Patreon page. But thank you very much for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. This episode of Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics, who are shaking things up at your local comic shop right now. It's the Christmas season. It's time to start thinking about uh, gifts for your friends and uh, the comic book fan in your life. And uh, Aftershock has a whole slew of books in many different genres that will definitely fit your comic friend's needs. And also introduce them to a new series 
or graphic novel that they maybe never had considered before. Things like A Walk Through Hell by Garth Ennis and Gordon Sinsuka. Baby Teeth, the year one hardcover available from Donny Cates and Gary Brown. The first 10 issues are already in stores this week. In a couple weeks, you'll see Witch Hammer, Aftershock's first original graphic novel by Dalibor Talajic and Cullen Bunn. It's going to be in comic stores the week of December 19th. But uh, you'll find a lot of great books and a lot of great genres written and drawn by your favorite writers and artists at Aftershock Comics. Don't take my word for it. You can check out full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. All right, let's get into our conversation now with Brian Collins about his grandfather, Craig Collins, the creator of Kevin the Bold and Mitzi McCoy. And we talk about uh, the evolution of those strips and more on today's Word Balloon. Brian Collins, welcome to Word Balloon, and congratulations on what I imagine is a very interesting journey uh, in your own family tree and in the comic strip world. Yeah, hi, John. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It is It has been a really amazing uh, process putting this book together and uh, kind of learning about the process as I've done it. So uh, did you always know growing up about your grandfather's cartooning career? Did you know your grandfather? I, I knew my grandfather just a little bit. He died before I was 10, okay. and by the and he was living in Michigan. Uh, I was born in Michigan, but my family had moved away to western New York State by then. So we would see them on the holidays, but uh, my my dad, uh, my grandfather's oldest son, he, he and my grandfather weren't that close, actually. Oh. And so I did, I did know he was a cartoonist, and he was, you know, there was, did seem to be a certain amount of uh, fame or whatever associated with that. But my dad really did not dwell on his, his uh, career much, let's just say. Understood. Well, you know, and, and I'm glad that you've uncovered. What made you uncover this, then, these, these strips and this career? Well, I, I work as a graphic artist, and uh, I've worked as a freelancer for a long time. And so I was always, you know, my grandfather was, uh, he, he, you know, despite uh, he and my dad not being very close, he did loom very large. And just the whole concept of, of uh, working for, for himself and becoming successful, um, it, it, uh, it kind of appealed to me. Um, I, at, at one point, I, I, uh, I acquired a couple years of his comics, and uh, and then from then uh, just started discovering. You know, I think this was before eBay even existed, but after <laughs> at that point, I just found other channels to find more of his comics. That's great, and yeah, I can imagine, and especially as you say, prior to this eBay generation, um, we all talk about this in the pop culture world about the the pursuit of these kinds of artifacts uh, in that pre digital world. And, you know, you had to go to collectors, uh, newspapers and magazines and literally look in the classifieds and, and try and hunt stuff down. Did you put out any sort of classifieds yourself saying that? And forgive me, how do you how do you pronounce your, your grandfather's full name? It's Cray. Cray Collins. Cray Collins. OK. So, yeah, yes. did you, you know, wanted Cray Collins art? Did you do those kind of ads and things like that? No, I didn't. Um, I was working at a at, at this time. I was working a staff job in a place, and because I was in the art department, we had color printers, and uh, there was an intern that came in, and he was a comic book collector, and he had he had purchased a comic book that was missing its cover, so he had a he had a JPEG of the thing, and he asked me if I'd print it out for him, okay. and uh, so at that point, you know, I mentioned my grandfather, and and he said, oh, you could probably, you know, and he's the one that led me to this site, and I don't I don't even know what it is anymore to tell you the truth, but uh, he he. He led me to the place, and I remember it was uh, two years of Sunday half pages for eighty bucks, and I was like, "Hey, this is this is pretty cool." And, wow! And, uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was, uh, I guess, and then at, at that point, once I I made this discovery and I printed them out, and uh, I I decided I well I printed out two sets and I bound one into a three ring binder and sent it to my my uncle Kevin. Okay. And uh, at the time, Kevin was still living in the old family house. Uh, and despite my grandfather having passed away in 1974, um, my grandmother was still alive, and she was about 95 at the time. And uh, so I knew he, you know, I knew that he, there was still some material left at the house. Okay. But I knew in particular he'd be very interested in, in what I'd found. Sure. And yeah, that I was going to ask that. What kind of um, did he have a reference file? I mean, how much do you know? about uh Cray's process in terms of like and what he saved. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, he he had a he had a lot of files. He saved everything um 
for for better or worse, uh, my grandmother uh, donated all of, almost all of his stuff to the Grand Rapids Public Library. Fantastic. So, yeah, no, it is good. And, and, you know, sometimes I feel a little bit jealous, like when I've, I've been there several times and doing research and photographing the original artwork for these comic strips and, and thinking like, you know, I try not to dwell on, oh, this could all be mine, but uh, it's really, <laughs> <I understand. laughs> it's, it's, it's really true that, I mean, if it was mine, I don't know where I'd store it and nobody would ever see it. And, and, the, and in the situation being at the library, you know, you just got to fill out a form and the librarians there are fantastic and they'll, they'll show you anything you want to see. Are you aware, uh, Cullen Murphy, who uh, the son of John Cullen Murphy, and the and the <laughs> the uh, guy who d- did the dialogue with his father for Prince Valiant after Hal Foster stopped doing yes. the strip? Did you are you aware of that book that he put out at the beginning of this year called uh, Cartoon? The, the yeah, the Connecticut Cartoonist. Yep. Yes, I am. Yep, I, I I am. I mean, even prior to that book coming out, I have been fascinated by uh, the life of these. Uh, comic strip newspaper comic strip cartoonist and and i don't want to like forgive me if this sounds like a slight but you yourself say that cray was not one of the household names was not a milton kniff was not a even a john cullen murphy necessarily but i you know i'm a broadcaster and i always call myself a journeyman broadcaster because i've worked consistently for over 25 years in radio that said actually longer than that that said um it's um you know, I'm not one of the big names. I'm a, I'm a foot soldier. I'm a, you know, and it and it sounds like you know your grandfather, while having success. And we're going to talk about a couple of the strips, but um, you know, I I don't even know. Like Mitzi McCoy, this is a fascinating artifact in particular because did it have how wide of a uh, distribution did it have a circulation did it have? It you know I'm not sure exactly it, when it launched. It had about forty papers, okay. and it probably only got to fifty or something like that. Um, the and I don't I don't even know what's typical for a, for one of the NEA, NEA comics, but uh, it it kind of uh, the, uh, my grandfather's boss, uh, this guy Ernest Lynn, mm-hmm. he thought it had breakout potential, and I think it was pretty successful, but it just didn't pop the way that they were hoping, and I think that they that was more or less the reason why it it morphed into the next uh the next version uh, we, Kevin the Bold. Yes, which is fascinating and I want to get to that absolutely. Um you know I, I have to be honest because I was reading uh, you you provide an incredible text and history of of Cray's background and what led to Mitzi McCoy in the book and it's a beautiful strip first of all and and you know obviously your grandfather was a hell of a draftsman and and really that perfect timing of uh, beautiful girl art. I think of things like the Torchy comic mm-hmm. strip, and certainly Brenda Starr. And it seems mm-hmm. like Mitzi McCoy is kind of in that vein. Although, as you say, um, as he was trying to build an audience, he was experimenting with the types of stories he was telling. There are absolutely uh, upfront adventure stories and some noir kind of stories in there as well. But there also are kind of slice of life romance and and a little somewhere along the lines of Archie. In terms mm-hmm. of just kind of, I mean, obviously adults rather than teenagers, but you know that kind of romance kind of kind of thing. Would it, would you agree? Yeah, there was uh, when when um, when my grandfather uh, first pitched the idea, it wasn't uh, centered around the female, you know, a female character. It was like she was just going to be one of the players, which is sort of how the strip ended up uh, ev- evolving. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but his boss, you know, I guess it was the, you know, the marketing angle is to name it after the girl and to give her a more prominent role. Uh, that was, that was all the, the syndicates, uh, you know, uh, input. Sure. No, it's great, man. And I, I love, there's even one, one story where they're doing a live pinup fashion show. And yeah. This is great. Late forties. So it's that classic, you know, kind of glamor girl yeah. uh, era and everything. And uh, they they even have the men dressing up in uh, in uh, pinup costumes, which I think is pretty forward uh, for you know the time and everything, and also uh, really funny. Um, yeah, it's an interesting idea for a story. So yeah, I, I really uh, now these are these are Sunday strips. Uh, was it was it always just a weekly strip or was it a daily? It was just a Sunday strip. Um, okay. When I was when I was doing the research, there, like a, a lot of the material that's at the library in Grand Rapids, it's it's, it's not all the correspondence, but it's like uh, the bulk of the correspondence back and forth with his boss. And there was some uh, some talk about turning it into a daily, but it never never materialized. And and as you say, now it now it, at its height, it had fifty papers. One of those papers, a very big paper, the Chicago Tribune, my my hometown paper. And yeah, that go ahead, th- yeah. Th- 
I'm, I'm sorry. I was going to say, yeah, that was actually, actually the Trib picked up Kevin the Bold when it launched. So Mit- Mitzi itself never appeared oh. in it. There was a, there was a, a Christmas sequence, uh, December 1949, that ran on Saturdays in the Trib, but it was, it was, was not Mitzi McCoy branded. It was just called the Christmas story. It was kind of a generic thing, but the artwork was, was exactly the same as the Mitzi, uh, comics that were appearing in the other papers at the time. I see. And, and you also lay out too, uh, a lot of the strips and features that your grandfather did prior to Mitzi. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, please. I, I, you fill in the blanks now. And if you wanted to, you can you can highlight some of these that he had done. Yeah, no. It, well, it was uh, he 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 he'd gotten a lot of exposure uh, uh, in, the, in the 40s, right before Mitzi started. He was doing religious comics for the Methodist Publishing House. Okay. And what these things were were Bible story comics. Uh, they were they were part of a, like a Sunday school package, and so these things were distributed to to the kids going to Sunday school. Sure. And I think there might have been a distribution up to like five hundred thousand of these things wow. every week. So I don't know that his his name uh, got any recognition because these things were probably kind of disposable. Understood. But at any rate, there was a lot of uh, exposure, uh, you know, of some sort. That's cool. And then he kind of did a. It wasn't a Ripley's Believe It or Not, but there was this like kind of factual feature that he was drawing as well correct yes that was that was earlier that was in the 30s it was for michigan's the centennial of michigan statehood and so it it appeared in a six or ten newspapers in michigan and it was a daily and i think it was like three facts that were three or four facts were illustrated in a single panel and it ended up running for about a year and a half uh and so there was this was again great exposure in in his home state of michigan man you got to get tim allen and uh, see if you can do a combination of your grandfather's art and get somebody like Tim Allen, who I know does a lot of Michigan tourism, uh, yeah. radio and TV spots, and have him like read the factoids or whatever. I think that might yeah. be an interesting little uh, modern and, and throwback kind of uh, Michigan kind of celebration. Yeah, well, hopefully sooner than the 200th anniversary, er, exactly. anniversary of Michigan <laughs> Statehood. <laughs> Maybe 175 if we're around that ballpark. I'm not sure. There we go. Good, good, yeah. There you go. I, well, and again, I, forgive me. I'm not going to do the math. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but um, no, it's really interesting. All right, so we mentioned Kevin the Bold, and I love the fact, and, I, and I, I'm assuming that this was the norm in some strips, that um, it's like a television backdoor pilot where on All in the Family we meet Cousin Maud. And then, mm-hmm. you know, within the year, B. Arthur has her own series as Maud. And, you know, right. that's, you know, that kind of thing. And so, literally, Kevin the Bold, which is kind of a Prince Valiant era sort of uh, strip. And um, all of a sudden, uh, they're, they're talking in uh, the newsroom. And uh, Stubby, the editor, is uh, saying, oh, yeah, you ever hear about uh, Mitzi's uh, relatives? And, oh, yeah, it goes way, way back. And all of a sudden, we get this great backdoor introduction into Kevin the Bold. That's great. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was interesting because there were there were a f- uh, several times uh, during Mitzi McCoy's run where they did this kind of a narrative, uh, th- you know, throwback kind of thing, and these these sequences tended to generate more fan mail, and so this this they thought, well, this is the perfect setup to to you know to change change the thing into Kevin the Bold, and uh, and it was interesting because so the papers that had already ran uh, that had been running Mitzi McCoy. They Kevin, the first several Kevin the Bold uh, episodes didn't have the Kevin the Bold logo. It was it was Mitzi McCoy, the McCoy family legend, oh. and uh, so it was maybe after three or four weeks of that, then they then they just started running it as Kevin the Bold itself. But uh, the 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 papers like the Tribune that that uh, picked up Kevin only on its launch, they had the uh, Kevin the Bold logo as part of the artwork. Got it. Now I I noticed too that obviously this is uh, Craig Collins Volume 1, and uh, yes. how, how many years did Mitzi run? Mitzi ran for just under two. Okay. And then Kevin had a had a really impressive run, right? Yeah, Kevin ran for 18 years. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, and uh, initially, after you know, after I bought these first two years of Sundays, and I told my Uncle Kevin about it, and he it turned out he had a bunch of comics that hadn't been given to the library, so he started sending me these packages as he, as he kind of uh, excavated them from the you know different storage places sure. in his house. <laughs> sure. And uh, so he and I, you know, right away, we were both, you know, thought, oh, this would be great. Let's do a Kevin the Bold book. You know, this is this is the more famous strip. And uh, anyway, the, 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 when I was getting the comics, I didn't get, you know, episode one to episode a thousand or anything. They were kind of 
you know, missing here and there. Sure. And so they started filling in the blanks here and there, D- eBay or another package from Uncle Kevin. But uh, the idea of uh, Kevin the Bold book, because it ran so long, was was kind of intimidating. So True. I think it's about the years, yeah. Yeah. So about the third package I got from Kevin included all these Mitzi McCoy strips. And I had heard a little bit about it, but I had never seen one. And when I saw, okay, there's, I think there's 99, I was like, oh, that's, that's definitely a more manageable book. It's clear where it's going to begin and where it's going to end. So, so uh, that, was, that became the focus. Interesting. So, so do you think for subsequent volumes, are you going to pick some of like Kevin's better stories? How, what do you think you're going to do? Well, the publisher I'm working with, he wants to, to uh, for volume two, he wants to do a book of the religious comics. Okay, sure. And uh, he's, he's got, uh, apparently he's got a complete set of them, and I've seen uh, maybe half of them, um, tear sheets that are at the library, or, uh, or ones that my uncle still has. And... Uh, and, and actually, I think it would be a great it'd be a, a great idea because this the artwork again is 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 very nice, and you know the story is obviously quite timeless, so it's it's not going to appear dated, you know. But uh, uh, so, anyways, that's that's the plan for volume two would be the uh, the uh, Bible stories comics. That, that's fantastic, and it's interesting because it really does show the versatility of Cray. Let's take a moment from our conversation with Brian and talk to you a bit about one of our sponsors today, Aftershock Comics. Now, I know you know all about Aftershock's titles. You've seen them on the racks of your favorite comic shop, a whole slew of fresh high concepts, titles written and drawn by your favorite creators. It's Christmas season. This is a perfect time to consider a gift of a trade, a graphic novel from a top creative team in a brand new story that isn't on their usual radar or radar as far as your friends who love comics. There are great books to choose from right now. The spy series Jimmy ba- Jimmy's Bastards from Garth Ennis and Russ Braun. There's also Pestilence from Frank Thierry and Oleg Akunov where the 14th century black plague from history is actually revealed as the first recorded zombie outbreak. You can get the first trade now, whet their appetite, and the second trade will be available in early January. There's a great volume on Donny Cates and Gary Brown's series, Baby Teeth, Year One Hardcover, the first 10 issues in comic shops this week and available now at AfterShockComics.com. There's also Witchhammer, Aftershock's first original graphic novel from Cullen Bunn and Dalibor Talajic. That's going to be in comic shops December 19th. We'll be talking to more creators from Aftershock in the days and weeks ahead, and uh, you'll hear all about some of these excellent books. But you don't have to wait. Check out full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books and more to order through your local shop at AfterShockComics.com. Let's get back to our conversation with Brian Collins about Mitzi McCoy and Kevin the Bold on Word Balloon. Mitzi teases in a in a very clean way. It's it's and it's it was very interesting to learn that uh, your grandfather kind of modeled Mitzi after Rita Hayworth. And, yes, but, but it's definitely that kind of uh, friendly cheesecake, if you will, of the yes. period. And then, you know, to do the Bible stories as well. And again, it just shows your, your grandfather's versatility. And then you go to this kind of, you know, um, warrior sort of uh, adventure strip in Kevin. That's that's really interesting. And uh, I, I, I think that's terrific. I um, yeah, I really I hope that eventually you will you will get to uh, we have some uh, Kevin stories in the Mitzi book, which is cool. Yes. Um, yeah. But I can appreciate, yeah, because you figure, like, were you able to figure out how, like, did he do, um, when he was doing Mitzi, now it was a Sunday strip, so was it, I don't know, four stories a year, uh, you know, six stories a year? Yeah, they 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 ran. Usually, they're about eight weeks long or so. Okay, so sure. I think I think if if there, there's basically twelve twelve different storylines in the nearly two years that the the comic ran. So cool. yeah, about six about six a year. Interesting. Um, no, I love it, man. I, do you remember uh, what were some of your favorite uh, comic strips back in the day? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Peanuts. Sure, of course. Uh, I mean, anyway, when I was young, I liked, uh, you know, I, I, Broomhilda. I mean, it's... it's sure, it's, Broomhilda, absolutely. In, in, <laughs> absolutely. in BC. I love uh, BC. You know. I was a big Johnny yeah. Craig fan, absolutely. Not Johnny yeah. uh, Johnny Hart. Johnny Hart, yes. So, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. But, That's uh, excellent, man. No, I'm, I'm with you. Hager the Horrible was a big favorite of mine as well. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't, I hadn't really gotten into, into the dramas or the adventure strips until I got older. And now I really do appreciate not just the adventure strips. I mean, you know, you start with Kniff, 
And and I want to mm-hmm. point out too, because you know Kevin the Bold, and and you know we compare it to Prince Valiant. Hey, Kniff was out there doing Terry and the Pirates and Steve Canyon, and there was still room for Frank Robbins to do a Johnny Hazard adventure strip, which is very clearly inspired by the Kniff stuff. But it's still great stuff, and, I, and that's the thing. And certainly all the King feature syndicated adventure strips that Lee Falk did, Mandrake the Magician and the Phantom. And and some of these things, but I really now, as I'm older, really into you know God. Um, and now I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Rip Kirby, uh, the guy who created uh, Flash Gordon as well. And shame right. on me. Uh, but, uh, but Alex Raymond. Alex right? Raymond, of course, Alex Raymond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know stuff like that. And uh, now I'm looking at my my bookshelf. Uh, the the uh, secret agent Corrigan that started off as secret agent X nine that started with Raymond and then guys like Al Williamson took over. Um, I I love that stuff and even Apartment three G and mm-hmm. and some some of the soap operas and Gil Thorpe was a great uh, sports drama that mm-hmm. uh, played out in in the Tribune locally. Uh, no, so it it really is interesting because these were made for an adult audience. The I mean, or I should say, a general audience. Yeah. Yeah, they had they they would they would uh, they were yeah definitely some adult themes in in Mitzi and uh, yeah. but then for for a new chapter they'd introduce uh, like a, a young boy and he'd kind of take take a big part and so you could see they're trying to rope in some younger readers and then there's a young girl featured in another in another sequence so it was it was interesting how they were trying to really broaden the broaden the reach of the strip. Well, that's what I think makes the book very interesting too because you are on the journey with Cray as he's trying to figure out what the right formula might be for this. I'm all, right. I, 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 I mean, as, as great as it is to examine the big hits, it's great to see something like this that was, a was you know, I, and again, I feel like I'm condescending. Not a minor hit, but I mean, 40, 40 papers is certainly an impressive number. But yeah, you know, and again, just the experimentation. And I think uh, you do a great job uh, with your text pieces that uh, accompany each story. As as uh, Cray is trying to figure out, all right, what's going to sell here? Oh, let's put a dog in on this story. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. And as yeah. the cast expanded as well, it's it's really cool. And you really feel like you're on a journey with Cray as he's trying to figure this strip out. Yeah, and it's and it was it was what was really uh, great for me to, was just reading all the correspondence between him and and his boss because uh, it filled in a lot of the blanks and a lot of the things that they're talking about are you know are things you know you're still hearing about now like uh, people's attention spans shortening and how television is killing off the the, the serial you know comic strips. Wow, even and, in the forties, uh, even in the forties, yeah. that was a concern. Go on. Yeah, yeah. The glowing, the glowing box, I think they called it, or something like that. But uh, and also, you know, in talking about newspapers shutting down, and it's like, oh, it's it's you know, it's, wow. it's been a long, slow process, and it's and it's and it's sad to hear, but it's it's interesting too. Totally, no, and again, that's yeah, I, and and truly, it it breaks my heart because I do think the comic strips were always really, really interesting, a wide variety from the gag strips to the continuing story strips. Um, and they they hold up. I really, I mean, honestly, uh, they're like watching Turner Classic movies. It, it, it feels like that in the best possible way. That yeah. they're evocative of the time, and God, the art is beautiful. The storytelling is really tight, and uh, yeah, I just, I think it's, I think it's a really great examination of what was popular entertainment back then and god i mean you and i both uh were close enough in age i'm assuming that you know we remember riding you know the subway or the you know public transportation and everybody's face buried in a newspaper yeah absolutely. Uh, on, the, on the way home or on the way to work and yeah you know i mean so that's the thing and and that i mean i i know from reading all of these histories of comic strips how important uh the comic section was to the sales of a newspaper as as important as the news and the sports, and you know yeah, you needed defi- a good you needed a good couple pages to keep uh, readers' attention. Definitely, and like now, images are just everywhere. Um, but but yeah, in the forties, you know, it was like the only co- color that appeared in the paper was the comic section, and so it was a really splashy kind of uh, section, you know. Yeah. So did you have to uh, touch up anything and and uh, reconstruct anything to make it look better than whatever found original art you were able to work with? Yes, very much so. Um, the, the comics I got back for, that I that I received from my uncle, I mean, they they'd been they hadn't been 
they, they were very yellowed. Some of them were torn. Sure. Some of them, some of them were in really bad shape. And so they, they all took a lot of color correcting. And, uh, there were, in some cases, they were, they were tabloid comics that, uh, the way that the NEA, uh, uh, formatted their 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 comics. Uh, the the tabloids were missing a little panel, the throwaway panel, and uh, mm-hmm. it was it it you know so it's kind of like finding finding a throwaway panel or recreating it uh, maybe from a a crummy black and white uh, microfilm version and and trying to touch it up as best I could without uh, you know ruining the artwork or anything like that. But there was there was quite a bit of uh, a bit of uh, you know re, uh, re reconstructing some of these things. Fantastic, man! No, really, really a great, a great job. And again, you were kind enough to send me a digital copy. Copy, and I mean, good lord, the the, the digital copy looks great, and uh, can't wait to see the the finished book as well. But this really is—it's a really interesting look at a working class cartoonist who, you know, again, you know, achieved. I mean, do you, how would you gauge your your grandfather's career? Well, he was he was. Uh it's interesting because he started as a painter. You know, he was cl- classically trained, and he you know he went to Europe as like a a really young man and was painting in the Louvre and the banks of the Seine and you know all this sort of cliche things. He 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 worked like crazy. His career started in the Depression, but he he kept busy and he always did pretty well. Um, at a certain point, he was I think he was painting murals for the the Texas Centennial or something, 1936, wow. and. He had an he had an accident and fell off a scaffolding and he kind of wrecked his shoulder, oh, and uh, so he this kind of uh, killed his painting career for a while. But it, he started he started doing the black and white you know pen and ink illustration, and so that's that's about when the the, the newspaper the daily feature the do you know thing that appeared in Michigan started. So it was kind of like he he almost fell into cartooning because the the do you know thing led to the Bible stories comics and then the, that led to his association with the NEA. Um, so he was, I mean, he was, uh, in, in my mind, he was a, he was a bigger name than I think he was, you know, cause he, like I said, he loomed large in our family. And it was interesting cause when I was, when I was trying to, uh, uh, find a publisher for the book, I thought, you know, there's never been a collection of my grandfather's work. You know, this should, you know, somebody should want to do this, and and and, and the publishers weren't weren't lining up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but but it was it was great because the the guy I did find it's it's right up his alley, and and he's you know it's, he's he publishes uh, artists like my grandfather, and uh, and now we've we've got a pretty nice partnership, and you know he's he wants to put out several more volumes of of my grandfather's. Uh, artwork, so I think you know that's that's just incredible, and you know it's like for the, this book took me about five years from you know starting to scan the comics and figure out how to how to make it into a book before it got printed, and uh, so at least there's one, and and you know the, the, I don't know if I'll be involved as is uh, as heavily in in the future volumes. But uh, if I have the time, I would love to. But uh, if not, uh, it seems that there's going to be more books coming out, and that's that's just incredible. Understood, and yeah, congratulations on that. Will there be any? Uh, have you spoken to anyone in in Michigan at the state level, uh, or even at the, in the libraries? Obviously, as you say, your grandfather's papers are at the at the Grand at the Grand Rapids Library. Are you going to do any sort of presentations? Because it would seem that uh, that's obviously a place where his body of work was, you know, printed and and certainly known. Yeah, no, I I, uh, I just recently contacted the Grand Rapids Public Library to find out uh, how to how to donate a book to them, and uh, they responded and and told me they wanted they'd love to have me do a presentation. They it's these terrific. these uh, these librarians up on the fourth floor in the local history department they're they're awesome, and uh, you know I, I fondly remember them, and it, it's really nice that they remember me too. So we don't have a date for it yet, but I'm I'm hoping it'll be maybe early in 2019. But uh, there's there's definitely uh, a big audience uh, in Michigan, in, in West Michigan, where my grandfather lived, and there's a lot of people that still remember his work there. Um, there's you know several of the high schools still have these uh, like WPA uh, era murals on their on their walls, and uh, so it's it's nice to have a have an audience. You know, if I say oh his 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 name is somewhat forgotten uh this is a place where it's it's still remembered so that's that's really nice that's excellent man and yeah it's those kind of things too like the wba pa projects that are very interesting and 
Uh, yeah, I, I, th- I think that's great. God, I hope they uh, videotape whatever presentation you end up doing. I'm, I'm, I'm in Chicago, so can't make it to Grand Rapids to, to see that. But, uh, yeah, I, I, th- I think that's wonderful. And, and again, it's, I, I really, it, it's sad and it's interesting because unfortunately, as each generation moves on, things do get forgotten. And I just think the history of newspaper comic strips is fascinating. Um, and, and yeah, I'm glad to see that uh, people remember and would like to help you promote your grandfather's body of work. And I'm glad you found a publisher to, to keep things going. So um, to, to wrap up, I mean, it, you know, have, have we missed anything? I, I don't want to uh, wrap up with you in, in case there was any, any more to say specifically about uh, the Mitzi McCoy book. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I mean, I could the 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 publisher's name is uh, Lost Art Books, and they're at picture this pick. What is, I got to get the URL straight if I'm going to plug them here. All good, man. <laughs> picture picture this press dot com. Picture this so, press uh, dot com. Lost Art Books. Yes, and uh, yeah. So so the 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 guy uh, Joe that runs that is the publisher. He he has a day job, so this is a sideline for him. So he, t- he tends to put out a couple of books a year. So it's it's kind of when schedules permit and when our schedules sync up. And uh, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully there'll be another volume that'll be appearing in September of 2019. Excellent! It's the Lost Art of Cray Collins, Volume One, the complete Mitzi McCoy, and uh, by Cray Collins and. Uh, Edited and uh, put together by uh, Brian Collins, who we're speaking to. I, honestly, if you're a, if you're a comic strip history fan, this is a very interesting artifact to come across and uh, purchase and explore because I really think you'll appreciate Cray's beautiful work. I mean, this is really outstanding uh, illustra- illustrations and uh, and very good storytelling as well. So uh, it's another great. You know, I'm, I always try during the holiday season to point out interesting. Uh, potential uh, gift buys and i would certainly say the complete mincy mccoy is a a perfect example of that so congratulations brian honestly this is a great book and uh best of luck on volume two i hope there's a volume three and like i said i hope uh i hope you uh, consider uh uh, continuing with uh and and now shame on me i'm blanking kevin the bold yes (laughs) kevin the bold yes absolutely man no and and again there's that's gonna be that's volume three kevin the bold all right, it makes sense. And yeah, no, and in, again, you get a good sense of Kevin the Bold in Volume 1. So uh, a lot of interesting tori- storytelling ideas from Craig Collins in this uh, Mitzi McCoy Volume 1. So congratulations, man, and uh, yeah, good luck with everything. Thank you so much, John, and thanks for having me on War Balloon. Brian Collins, I hope you'll consider the complete Mitzi McCoy. It would make an excellent Christmas gift. It's from Lost Art Books and uh, an interesting exploration of Brian's grandfather, Craig Collins. I hope you enjoyed today's Word Balloon. It was brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Truly, League, I appreciate the support uh, through the holiday seasons and beyond by subscribing to Word Balloon. Do you like what you hear with Word Balloon? Do you think that it's uh, worth the price of a comic book each month or even a dollar a month? If you can spare it and would consider subscribing to Word Balloon, you can do that via Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners. This episode is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. It's the Christmas season, and Aftershock has a whole slew of books in various genres by your favorite writers and artists, and I think you will find an interesting new series to introduce to the comic fan in your life. A new Aftershock series or graphic novel would make an excellent Christmas gift. You can consider things like Beyonders by Paul Jenkins and Wesley St. Clair, Animosity by Marguerite Bennett and Raphael De La Tour, Lollipop Kids from Adam and Aiden Glass and Diego Yapur, and Baby Teeth, the year one hardcover from writer Donny Cates and Gary Brown, the first ten issues already in comic shops. You can also consider Pestilence from Frank Thierry and Oleg Akunev, The first trade paperback is now available. The second trade will be available in early January. Uh, Of course, Witchhammer, Aftershock's first original graphic novel from the team of Cullen Bunn and Dalibor Talajak. That will be in comic stores December 19th. Do yourself a favor. Check out full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. Thanks again for listening. More Word Balloon coming in December. Great conversations on the way. It's going to be a tremendous holiday season with a lot of interesting conversations in the Word Balloon tradition. I hope you'll check them out. If you're a boxing fan, I have the Big Bout podcast. It's a new addition to the Word Balloon Network. I've been doing it since September. Uh, I had a great conversation this week with Doug Fisher, the editor of Ring Magazine. And uh, you can find uh, that podcast 
in the same places that you find Word Balloon, iTunes, Stitcher, and the like. And you can find them uh, under the name The Big Bout Podcast. I hope you'll check that out. Of course, there's the Ah Yeah Podcast with Art and Franco. We're still cranking out episodes, and uh, we're going to do our best to do uh, some great December episodes for you as well. Uh, Great stuff from the Word Balloon Network, and happy to present it to you each week. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2018.